Let's take some time to think about John Lorenzo Bernini. If anybody can be called Mr. Baroque, it would be Bernini. Uh, he had some of the greatest commissions as a sculptor and architect uh, in the Baroque period. In 1629, he was given the uh, job to continue the renovations and uh, expansion of the uh, uh, Basilica of St. Peter's uh, that Michelangelo had worked on and others. And his great contribution, of course, was the introduction of these colonnades that come down and sweep around and create this great oval piazza uh, in front of the um, edifice of the great St. Peter's Basilica. I love this photograph because it also uh, has in it, it shows us the re relationship of uh, St. Peter's to a little tiny building over here, looks small. This is uh, the Sistine Chapel. And so we look at that and we can see uh, that's where Michelangelo painted his ceiling, right underneath that roof there. Um, and over here, these are the papal apartments. So this is where Raphael painted his School of Athens and these great Renaissance masterpieces right next to each other, right next to the Sistine Chapel. And then over here is the Baroque uh, building uh, that Bernini worked on. So. Um, this photograph's kind of great for showing all of that. Uh, the, uh, the interior of St. Peter's is also gloriously uh, dramatic. It was the interior decorations were designed by uh, Bernini and uh, the um, light streams in and glints off the, the gilded bronze um, uh, decorations and it is crowned by this great canopy, this great bronze canopy called the Baldacchino that Bernini designed. This uh, is just absolutely dizzying in the unexpected changes and shifts of scale when you walk into this place. It's so enormous. That canopy, that bronze canopy there uh, is about the size of a nine or 10 story building. So it is uh, like uh, almost 100 feet high and um, it is dwarfed by the massive interior of the rest of the uh, the building. So it gives you a very uh, un, uh, untethered feeling when you walk through it because you, you really lose all sense of, uh, of uh, spatial relationships. Um, and when you can see it uh, full of people, it looks quite different. So this is how, uh, how it looks in the middle of mass. The Pope is up there saying mass underneath the baldacchino and you can see him there, uh, and you can see this array of people all around and how it fills up that space. Uh, but, you know, this, and this is an incredibly impressive uh, feat by uh, Bernini to design all of this. Uh, but also we want to remember that he is Mr. Baroque and what makes him Baroque? We want to think about Baroque art style and it's a romantic style, very different from the Renaissance, which was its intellectual uh, classical style. Uh, when we get to the Baroque in the 1600s, we had this romantic style and it's full of drama and action and movement, emotion and expression. And uh, that is just uh, full uh, in fully on display in uh, Bernini's work for certain. Um, and uh, nowhere more so than in his famous David. So it's so interesting that we have these various uh, artists all uh, uh, attempting the the subject of David because it allows us to really compare uh, how the their different visions for this uh, biblical hero uh, are, are portrayed. Um, and so we have uh, uh, John Lorenzo here uh, giving us his version of David. And it's full of the romanticism of the Baroque style. I like to look at it without all those words on the side. So let's just look at it by itself and give it a chance to just fo focus our attention on the artwork itself. It's filled with movement and action. And we see that in the crisscrossing dynamic um, uh, 
uh, lines of the uh, of David's body. So if we look, for example, and we sort of just follow, we have this this wonderful curving arm coming down this way and this curving sash that's going that way. And it makes a kind of a, a spiral all the way around. And then his whole back and body is um, leaning this way. We have this swirling bit of cloth here. And there's all this crisscrossing intersections of um, movement that uh, make it a very, very dynamic sculpture. Uh, so I don't know if I get rid of all these things here. Uh, and these things are uh, part of what makes it a Baroque piece. Of course, you really would uh, want to compare it to Michelangelo's David and see how, uh, how differently these two artists portrayed this. And the things that make Michelangelo's David so classical are the, uh, the flowing lines that we see that move up and down the body uh, very, very smoothly without a lot of intersection, interaction, crisscrossing or obstruction. Whereas I just was talking about all the movement that we see spiraling around that, that, that um, Bernini uh, fills his work with. Uh, Bernini makes David a coiled spring about to uh, burst into action. And that's another really important point about the differences here is that uh, Michelangelo presents us with David who is still, he is contemplating, he is thinking, he is not yet acting. But Bernini gives us uh, David in the midst of action. Uh, and that uh, if you feel that if you blink, you will miss something, he will move and you'll have missed the action because that's a, a Baroque idea of showing the, um, the action in the middle of its uh, of, of it taking place. So there's always an element of split second timing uh, in Baroque art. It's a, it's a matter of, uh, of a, of a uh, very precise moment when things are happening. In the Renaissance, version by Michelangelo, it's timeless. There is no time. Time has, is standing still for Michelangelo's David. It's a, it's a moment outside of time. And while we can say that Michelangelo's David has a look of concentration on his face, it doesn't have the fierce emotional uh, expressiveness of Bernini's face. So we have all of these things that I was talking about, dynamism, drama, action, emotion, expression, all of that stuff is uh, just uh, packed into uh, Bernini's David. In fact, if you walk around, let's see if I have, if you walk around Michelangelo's David and walk around the sculpture, you know, from various angles, it really doesn't look all that different uh, because it is this kind of um, self-contained unit. And as you walk around the form, you still are uh, taken by the, the verticality and the, the languid lines that move us up and down the form. And we look, and no matter which position we're in, we're pretty much seeing very much the same kind of uh, form. But Bernini's David looks like a time-lapse photography as you walk around it. You walk around it and it seems like it is actually in motion. It looks like these are, these are frames of a movie, that, they, that this is um, uh, an actual action figure. And you get that, that full movement when you look at this sculpture. So um, just to look at a couple of other things. Um, oh, one other thing about these sculptures is they're so very different in size. That also contributes uh, to uh, their, the, their differences. Michelangelo's David is definitely not a normal human being. He's a supernatural human being. He's 14 feet tall. And uh, you really don't uh, get a sense of how big that is until you really stand under it because it, it just towers above mere mortals like you or I. Whereas Bernini's David is actually life size. Uh, it's a little more than five feet tall, uh, but it's crouching. So, it, you know, it's a little bit reduced. And so it's basically a, a life size human sculpture. So it's something that you can actually identify with because it's kind of your size. Um, 
Whereas, uh, and again, that separates Michelangelo's David, the sort of classical thing where basically classical art is an idea of something, an idea of the subject. Whereas Baroque and Romantic art is more trying to be really actual uh, and make you feel connected and make you feel a part of the art. Uh, one of my favorite sculptures by Bernini is Apollo and Daphne. I don't want to go into the whole story because it, uh, because uh, I love the story so much I would probably take a long time telling it. But uh, it's just a, a, a story of uh, pursuit. And Daphne is trying to uh, escape from Apollo and Apollo is chasing after her. Uh, and at the moment that he catches her, uh, she transforms into a laurel tree. And so this is the actual moment of contact. And you can see that uh, Apollo has got his hands finally around her torso just so that he can uh, feel uh, that underneath his fingertips, her flesh is turning into bark, which is beginning to envelop her lower body. And uh, her hair and her fingers are transforming into uh, twigs and sprigs and leaves and roots are beginning to grow from her toes and she's going to become rooted to this spot. And it's another example of the uh, the moment being so important in um, in Baroque sculpture. It's the actual moment of transformation here. And there's a lot of kind of spiraling, swirling, twisting action happening as well. We're kind of swept up the uh, from the from the foot of the statue uh, all the way through the the curve of Daphne's uh, beautiful form, and then we have it counteracted with the uh, the arms stretched out um, behind Apollo. Beautiful sculpture. Uh, another sculpture full of uh, uh, emotion is the Ecstasy of Saint Teresa, um, which is uh, a, a tour de force of emotional expressionism. Again, let's look at it without all those distracting. Uh, uh, captions there. I'll give you a second to look at those. Um, the Ecstasy of St. Teresa. St. Teresa uh, was a nun who was given to rapturous visions uh, in which she felt the Holy Spirit pierce her heart like an arrow, as she described it. And there we see the uh, angel uh, visiting St. Teresa with his golden arrow uh, about to uh, plunge it into her uh, chest. And she is uh, lying back in an ecstatic expression on her face and she's transported. Uh, we see this cloud has come up under her and lifted her up into heaven under these shafts of golden uh, uh, spiritual light. Uh, and um, we see um, the entire scene kind of taking place in midair. The, the other thing that's going on here that's so impressive about Bernini's, just his technical skill, is all the different textural uh, effects that he creates. So that we have the angel with these sort of fluffy feathers uh, in, in his wings, and then we have the angel's uh, garments are kind of some light gossamer that's kind of floating and flowing uh, around his body, whereas uh, the nun, uh, Teresa, is clad in heavy woolen habit that uh, uh, falls uh, upon her body. And then underneath that, he has rendered mist out of solid stone in this uh, form of this cloud kind of holding her up. And it's really just the, the transcendent way that he is able to transform that uh, stone into such incredibly different textual realities, that we believe in the soft pliability of the, uh, the, the nun's habit and the filmy uh, quality of the angel's uh, gown. And it's really quite remarkable. And Bernini is just a master at all of these different techniques. And just to tie it back to the idea of drama, drama was a, was a really, uh, it was a growing uh, I, uh, art form in itself. And what Bernini did in the chapel, the, uh, in the uh, Cornaro Chapel where this is located, he created a kind of a stage set 
so that it almost looks like a dramatic play. And in fact, to the left and right of the sculpture, there are actually balconies. And the balconies have got um, uh, people, portraits of people, the Carnaro family, uh, as if they're in box seats uh, watching this event take place. And it's really kind of interesting that um, he presents it almost as if it is a stage play. Uh, we can look and we can see there actually these are portraits of uh, the members of this uh, prestigious family who commissioned this chapel. And they are some paying close attention, some, you know, sort of talking with each other and some, you know, maybe checking out the playbill uh, to see who's like uh, coming up next on stage. Uh, and it's really kind of interesting that he incorporates this very stage set uh, uh, effect for uh, this uh, incredibly dramatic uh, religious moment that's taking place sort of on the main stage. So the drama, the action, the uh, emotion, uh, and of course, just the technical skill of Bernini makes him uh, just an incredibly uh, important uh, artist who probably ought to be better known. Uh, and he is absolutely uh, inextricably tied to the uh, movement known as Baroque art. And so that's why um, we can sort of think of him as Mr. Baroque. All right, well, that's uh, all I just wanted to uh, get to in uh, giving some more deeper uh, treatment to our understanding of Baroque art and of John Lorenzo Bernini.